Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, liebe Studentinnen und Studenten oder ehemalige Studentinnen und Studenten, es ist mir eine große Ehre und eine echte Freude, heute hier in diesem ehrwürdigen Gebäude äh, zu Ihnen sprechen zu dürfen. Professor Opitz hat das eingangs gesagt, er hat Aufgaben erteilt. Und äh, meine Aufgabe war nicht ganz klar. Es war in eine bildhafte Sprache formuliert. Du sollst ja ein Art Salzkorn in der Suppe sein. Was immer das heißt. Äh, äh, ja, äh, die Frage ist, ob Sie salzig äh, werden möchten. Und die Frage ist, ob ein alter Professor salzig sein kann. Das wird sich zeigen. Das wird sich in den letzten 40, 45 Minuten, vielleicht 50 Minuten zeigen. Und ich werde äh, jetzt meinen Vortrag fortsetzen auf Englisch. What's in the name? That which we call a rose, like any other name, would smell as sweet. Says Juliet in the most famous scene of Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet. That may be true for a poet, but surely not for a plant scientist. Also for historians, names can make a difference. The interrelation of the three thirds, Zwinglia, Swiss, and Reformation, in the title of this paper, for example, has a lengthy history of debate from the 16th century to our own days. Luther set the two and the deliberate aspects to undercut or devalue the theological significance of the Zwinglian Reformation continued through into the early 20th century. To cut a long story short, it suffice to recall that at the end of World War I, immensely fashionable among academic theologians and historians was Adolf von Harnack dictum. In the treatment of the history of dogma, from a universal point of view, Zwingli may be left out of account. The vast amount of primary and secondary source material made available at the third of the 20th century prompted a wave of research that reached feasible proportions in the 1940s and led to a drastic reappraisal of the reformers' thought and influence in the 1970s. The most notable contribution came from Gottfried Wilhelm Locher, who signaled the theological distinctiveness and coherence of Zwingli's teaching. Through countless studies, culminating in his monumental Die Zwinglische Reformation im Rahmen der Europäischen Kirchengeschichte, the preeminent Swiss scholar with Dutch roots, though, not only freed the Zurich reformer from the burden of the Lutheran accusations, but also assured him a significant place in the pantheon of the magisterial reformers. Locher's seminal work has stimulated a wide variety of specialized studies. Meanwhile, there is no sign that the flood of publication is abated and the subject continues to attract courageous and creative scholars. I bring this up 
because the organizer, but I should say Peter Lopez, uh, asked me to sketch out the broad lines of the historiography of the Zurich Reformation from 1979 onwards to set the scene and mark out the terror. My answer was, of course, a spontaneous yes, because I thought that I knew in broad strokes the long-running literature and debates that have grown up around the topic. As I began to prepare myself, listing the major publications of the period, many of them, by the way, penned by dear colleagues who sadly are no longer with us, as well as by many participants in this gathering. I increasingly realized the complexity of the task. The list of works grew until it greatly exceeded the work and time limits of this paper. Just to describe the most important books, let alone Gottfried Locher's Magnum Opus, it's clearly impossible. Therefore, I ask my colleagues' indulgence if I refer to teams more often than to individuals, to problems and issues rather than to monographs. The very abundance of scholarship makes such an approach necessary. The first and greater part of this presentation will address the major developments of the past 40 years by referring to the following subject headings, source materials, and key themes in the literature. In a second, smaller part, I shall point towards possible future research paths. First, the search material. In 1976, in his account of the Zwingli research in the 20th century, Ulrich Gebler praised the high scholarly standards of the critical edition of Zwingli's works, noting, however, that the section concerning exegetical writings on the New Testament had not progressed with the desired rapidity and consequently research had been severely curtailed. <clears throat> Their appearance was delayed by various factors for a further 37 years. But by the end of 2013, the five-volume set was published that completed the court regime's English Zemplische Werke. About one-fifth of the material consists of unpublished Zwingli texts. We can now better grasp Zwingli's biblical exegesis, his evolution from Erasmian humanist to reformer. Moreover, since his exegetical production took place within the context of the prophet's time, clearly the interpretation that resulted was a collective effort. However much the group of Zurich divines may have been dominated by the forceful personality of the reformer. Thus the study of these new documents can help us understanding the origins of the Zurich Reformation taught and institutions, as well as early modern biblical studies. In the period under review, the following long-standing projects were completed or are now well underway. The good example to begin with is Simbliana. <coughs> The journal published since 1897, 1897, a rich sea for scholars to mine. 
Responding to the challenges of the digital age, all volumes have been digitized and are now accessible for free with a three-year delay for the new issues. Currently, more than 2,200 full-text searchable essay titles in 202 different issues of the journal are available online. Much more substantive questions relate to other projects. Many researchers know and recognize mm -hmm. the Basel Disputation of 1526 as turning point in Swiss Reformation history. Among the grotesque gaps in our discipline, there was the surprising fact that we lacked a modern edition of the proceeding of that gathering. The amount of effort it took for the editors to produce this volume of over 700 pages is startling. From sifting through original handwritten notes jotted down during the disputation itself, to collecting the official and unofficial variants of minutes later published by Catholic and Reformed participants took altogether 17 years with many ups and downs, which I experienced on my own ski. Um, uh, since 2015, there is reason to be grateful for the splendid critical edition that brings huge benefits for Reformation scholars. Another example of fine editorial craftsmanship is the recent publication of Ulrich Zwingli's private library. The authors have patiently and exhaustively documented not only Zwingli's reading and the marginal notes Zwingli made in the books he owned. This had basically already been done by Walter Köhler in 1921. But what is new at this book is that the authors have also taken on the painstaking task of examining Zwingli's letters wherein he mentions what he is reading or makes striking, insightful or simply expressive comments on these books. Basically, the introduction to this book is Inuce, a intellectual biography of Spinelli. Urgently needed for classrooms or private study was a selection of Zwingli's writing in the original Latin and Greek and German text, together with a translation into modern German. Timely appearance in the 2018 of a handsome volume clearly meets that long standing desideratum, along with the four-volume collection of selected works published in 1995 by the Zwingli Verein. In passing, let me just mention that translations of Zwingli's writings into English and Italian progressed slowly but stably, whereas in French there is only a small selection of his works available. Not to be forgotten are the Dutch, and more recently, the Japanese and the Korean translations. Interesting, most of these texts are in the public domain and may be used freely for educational and academic purposes. Among other lacunae which were filled recently, some of the most interesting for Reformation scholars are the digital edition of selected Zurich legal source texts. 
from the Middle Ages and the early modern period, including normative texts like mandates, court rulings, arbitration awards, legal practice. Then the collection of the Zurich Church ordinances and a compilation of which trials culminating in that sentences which occurred in the Zurich territory in the period between 487 and 701. 1701. Together, these three collections are promising tools for research with broad implications for our understanding of the causes and consequences of the Zurich Reformation. Now, moving to the second leading Zurich reformer, the recent growth in scholarship on Heinrich Bullinger that emerged around the 400th anniversary of his birth in 2004, to which I shall return soon, has produced a series of outstanding publications of source material. among the most urgent desiderata that were fulfilled, there are the first ever critical edition of the Decades, the theological treatise De Scripture Sancte Autoritate, some of his influential pastoral writings, and last but not least, a remarkable, during the sh this very short period of time, a remarkable number of Bollinger's commentaries on the New Testament epistles. It is proper to recall here that also the text of the Consensus Tigurinus, known to most of us through the unsatisfactory version in the Calvi opera has recently been edited along with the correspondence between Calvin and Bullinger on the basis of the original manuscripts in Zurich and in Geneva. For anyone interested in sampling Bullinger's thought about a variety of issues of desiring just to get to know the reformer, Directly, there is now available a seven volume edition in modern German of the representative selection of his writings. Last, but by no means least, in this gallery of editorial venture is the monumental Tiguriner Chronic. Tigurin Chronicle, arguably Bullinger's most important historiographical work, that circulated in many manuscripts, copies, but had remained unprinted until now. This was published in 2018 after a gestation period of 50 years. As you can see, we are for the long duration. <laughs> uh, uh, um, important companion to this uh, fundamental work is certainly uh, Moser's, Christian Moser's monograph, uh, The Dignitate, this Arrhenius, Bullinger as historian. As positive as the situation looks with regards to sources, I must touch as well on three warning cases who have set out on the tortuous paths of the corpus of Zwingli's writings, discovers quickly that the splendid critical edition with this poor commentary still lacks an index. An edition without an index is like a house without a door. 
hardly accessible. This lacuna is now being met in part, in part, by the project Ulrich Zwingli Works Digital, which provides fully searchable transcription of the writings and the letters. Still missing are the uh, exegetical writings on the New Testament. This enables scholars partially to fill the gap. Uh, whether, owing to financial reasons, the critical apparatus that is the core of any critical edition and what makes it scholarly, uh, a scholarly object, was not digitized. Moreover, the project is far away from having achieved the goals set out in the original program plans, that is, producing the edition of Zwingli's complete works on a CD ROM, uh, with indexes of persons, places, and Bible verses, as well as lemmatized concordance. <coughs> I don't know whether this will ever happen. I promise. Well, okay. <laughs> you said, but until then, until then, we still have to proceed on the empirical path of tentative search with an orthography which is totally inconsistent and makes the approach to the text almost impossible. Funding constraints have had implications also for the recent edition of Oswald Nikoniev's correspondence. This is, your colleagues, one of the most fruitful sources for the knowledge of Swiss Reformation history, as you know. And not only that, the humanistic beginnings in the Sodalitas Erasmiana, far beyond the boundaries of the Confederation. <coughs> Nevertheless, the 1338 letters to and from Nicodius were published, not in the full text, but in a registry edition in modern German in which, by its very nature, the critical apparatus is highly compressed. The third case concerns, so to speak, the flagship of our editorial program at the Institute, the critical edition of Bullinger's Epistolary for which the waves have been a little choppy recently. We all know that this extraordinarily rich collection of source materials sheds light on the Zurich Reformation and far beyond in, on the international network of scholarly of scholars of early modernity. Since 1973, about a quarter of 12,000 extant letters from and to Bullinger have been published in 18 learned volumes that in terms of meticulousness exceeds acknowledged quality standards. Moreover, volumes 1 to 14 are now available as a digital version which allows full text search. From 2020 onwards, however, the traditional funding agency will no longer support the project. We are at the moment in the midst of a transition where the likely end point is that the remaining corpus of the correspondence will ultimately be stored online with minimal or no editorial work 
instead of being published in conventional printed volumes. The university foundation supports the institutes in this endeavor, uh, whose outcome, however, at this stage is not predictable, involves at any rate some degree of uncertainty. These three cases show how factors beyond strictly scholar criteria are transforming our discipline. But there is another trend that should be noted here. The publication of rare books, uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. The publication of rare books relevant for Reformation studies on the internet has made amazing progress during the past 10 years. Facsimile editions and digital texts have completely replaced the uh, microfiche collections of original works and have by now become an essential part of our research infrastructure. How will this explosion in the global availability of early text affect our scholarship? Surely research can be done efficiently, more comprehensively, and with fewer logistical and financial burdens than before. No doubt about that. Conversely, as the example of Bullinger's correspondence clearly shows, the pressure to, com to complete complex, expense, multi volume project may diminish somewhat, as many original texts at least become easier to acquire and cite. One cannot leave this section without mentioning a recent development. The publication of the edition of Swiss anarchist sources has somewhat had somewhat lessened over the past two decades or so. Cursory perusal of unnoted Reformation bibliographies shows clearly that lately several scholars have once again taken on this important task. While a striking proportion of research continues to be published in English, much of it by scholars from the Mennonite tradition, interestingly, there is an energetic return of Swiss scholarship to this absorbing area in the study of the Zurich uh, Reformation. <clears throat> I come soon to my second point, the key piece of research. Notwithstanding these transformations in the treatment of source material, one can certainly discern trends in research and writing about the Zurich Reformation over the past four decades. It may be helpful to begin reviewing what has become of some of the arguments that used to animate earlier generations of scholars. Some of them have collapsed. Others have lost some of their luster, while others still retain those ability. Let me address very briefly each of these three subject areas. First, the traditional idea that Luther is the preeminent reformer whose teaching provides the standard for evaluating all reformation efforts so that all the other reformers are in effect variants or deviants from him turned up massively in the media, theater pieces, and exhibitions 
on the occasion of the Luther decade 2008-2017. Yet, appearance can be deceiving. Unlike the commemoration in the spring, scholars have distanced themselves from this view during the past 35 years or so. Indeed, it has become highly problematic to employ narrowly Lutheran theological criteria in order to understand the religious upheavals in 16th century Europe. Today, the large majority of scholars examines Zwingli's theology in relation to its own substance and stress his theological independence. There are exceptions, of course, but not many. The second area, prior to Gottfried Locker's magnum opus, and until the 80s of the last century, it was customary to argue that Zwingli and the Swiss reformers demonstrated a near total disinterest in the doctrine of justification. <coughs> Careful examinations show that while they were absolutely uncompromising in stressing the need for sanctification as a life of obedience to the commandments, they were equally unyielding in the opinion that sanctification must be based upon an imputed, perfect righteousness and not on an inherent, imperfect righteousness. In other words, it cannot be said that they had a moralistic approach to justification, as you can read still nowadays in the textbooks. Rather, there is evidence that they are taught on the crucial subject represent an original voice in the remarkable polyphony of voices of the early reformers. And let me give credit at least to two uh, colleagues uh, who will be Lutheran colleagues like Bert Arm and Volker Rippin, whom I have seen the ring just now. Uh, because they have been very helpful in clarifying these issues. These and other striking peculiarities of the Zwinglian voice in the concert of the Reformation movement have led time and again to seek for an underlying and unifying principle, a kind of central motive. Uh, which brings together in one intelligible whole the various aspects of Stingley's thought. Uh, Gottfried Locker was very clear on this. He was unshakable in the determination to read Stingley's theology as essentially Christocentric. Now, this opinion once largely shared, no longer meets universal acceptance. In his full-scale comprehensive account of Zwingli's theology, Peter Stephens is certainly more guarded than Locher. Uh, the subject is adequately accounted for, but the support as I understand it, uh, is markedly thin. In a subsequent article, he stresses even the theocentric character of Zwingli's theology. On the other hand, in an admirably learned monograph, Bernd Hahn shows that freedom is the central theme of Zwingli's theology. 
not in an antinomial, but in a theocentric sense, of course. Uh, to complicate things further, why Locher emphasized the key role of Christology as center of Zwingli's theology, his doctoral student Walter Mayer in 1987 pleaded eloquently for the retention of eschatology as the center of Zwinglian theology. <coughs> and Martin Salman in turn introduced a concept indeed insufficiently discussed up until now in the literature, namely the heißgeschichtliche Gedankengänge, the notion of history of salvation uh, in Swingley's work. So you see the spectrum is becoming larger and larger. Even the extent of humanist influence in Zwingli as worked out by Locher is being rediscussed in fundamental essays by Cornelis Augustin, Christine Christopher Baden and others with somewhat more nuance so that the Erasmian contribution is still present, strongly present, but more easily distinguished by, from other influences. In addition, for example, a scholar pointed out the influence of Father Stapulensis, unknown up until now. Conversely, the question of Zwingli's relation to the diverse strain of scholastic theology and philosophy is still debated and controversial. Prevailing tendency, supported also by Locher, has been to associate him with the Via Antiqua, Via Tome, and especially Aquinas. Attempts have been made with varying degree of success to discover certain alchemist elements in Swingley's theology. In his Zurich dissertation of 2013, Daniel Bolliger placed the reformer's life and thought in a new, completely new horizon of interpretation, tracing the influence of Scotus and the Scottists on the reformer. According to Bolliger, Scotus' central theological claims got intensive infinity, radical freedom, the holy orderness, were enthusiastically embraced by Zwingli and in terms strongly reminiscent of their Scottish ancestry. While these discordant interpretations confirm the image of Zwingli as a highly eclectic thinker, <coughs> there is no need to capitulate skepticism. All in all, it seems that we rather need here a fresh, sophisticated exploration into the intellectual and historical context before 1590 in which Zwingli developed his thought and work. There is no need for me to cover all the central themes of the reformer teaching. This will be dealt with in the paper, the final paper. Um, so, uh, topics such as Bible, sacraments, church, ministry, state, and so on. Well, however, the results of the studies have refined and added substantial precision, but have not significantly modified Locke's full account of Zwingli's theology. The most interesting recent shift in the focus of research belongs in the realm of historiography. 
By and large, the modern historiography on the Zurich Reformation has been treated as the story of Ulrich Zwingli, although there has also been considerable interest in Anabaptism. While research on the early Zurich Reformation has continued up to now without interruption, since the mid of the 1970s, scholars have increasingly turned their attention to the second Zurich Reform, Heinrich Politik, <coughs> who during his long leadership of the Zurich Church carried on Zwingli's legacy, adapting some of his path-breaking insights the changing circumstances and establishing Zurich as a center of international Protestantism. Largely ignored for centuries, wasn't even mentioned in the church ordinances until 2010, uh, largely ignored for centuries, he was plucked from obscurity since the first Bullinger Congress, 1975 on the occasion of the 400th anniversary of his death in 2004, where his unique importance for the European Reformation was clearly outlined. Meanwhile, Bullinger's intimus and colleague, Peter Martin Bernini, uh, so popular in 16th century Zurich, that people would refer to him as Martyr Noster. Martyr Noster. Uh, also, Peter Martyr Bamini attracted increased scholarly attention, aided by the founding of a new series in English translation, Peter Martyr Bamini, that led to report here that uh, starting in 2019, uh, no, uh, nine, no, nine, nineteen, yes, uh, <coughs> the will be published by Brill. The new interest in Bollinger, Bermini, and the later Zurich Reformation included also scholars like Leo Newt, Rudolf Walter, Konrad Pelikan, Theodor Bibliander, Konrad Gessner, and others, others. Hand of heart, how many of you knew perfectly well all those names? But now this is the way that the research is going. Uh, and that was particularly important for offering a Swiss counterpart to the interest in confessionalization that dominated research on German Reformation through the end of the 20th century, and was stimulated by a series of conferences that strengthened the international community of scholars and disseminated their research. Two books are emblematic of this historiographical shift. Bruce Gordon's Swiss Reformation still has <coughs> published in 2002. That's interesting to date. Still has Zwingli and the early Zurich Reformation at the center, but, but over than half of its contents are devoted to the developments after Spingley's death and extending to 1566, the year of the publication of the uh, Second Vatican Confession. Second example, the, the social history of reformed Christianity by Philip Benedict. Christ Church is purely reformed, demonstrates an entirely new approach, appreciation of the key role of the Zurich Church in the development of the reformed tradition. 
the Zurich Reformation is no longer seen merely as precursor of the important developments in Geneva. Finally, 500th anniversary of the birth of Heinrich Bullinger in 2004 and John Calvin in 2009, as well as the 400th anniversary of the death of Theodore Tudelis in 2005, promoted a remarkable renaissance of international scholarship. Conference volumes, essay, collection, new edition of primary sources, biographies, and so on, and so on, contributed significantly to the development of Swiss, Swiss Reformation style. Dispelling means, providing new insights into previously unexplored or less known areas, as well as changing existing patterns of interpretation. Now, the shift in emphasis from Zwingli to Bullig requires re-evaluation of the Zurich Reformation and of its impact on the larger Reformation movement that swept across Europe over the course of the 16th century. Few would deny that Zwingli's charismatic personality and his distinctive theology shaped the course of the Reformation in Zurich and enabled all the Swiss and other upper German territories to embrace the reformed faith. To describe, however, Ecolampadius, Vadia, Bollinger, Musculus, Verin, as Zwinglians, is a forced conversion that obscures rather than clarifies the issue. It has become doubtful whether the extraordinary variant theological, liturgical, catechetical, ecclesiastical, and social output of the Swiss Reformation is subsumable under what, under the notion of Zwinglianism, as Loch did, or even the more nebulous label. Uh, label uh, late Zwinglianism. And moreover, it has become increasingly clear that Zwingli's European influence was soon superseded by his Nachfolger, his successor, Bullig, who was undisputedly a true ecumenical thing. One broader effect of this process would be the name change from Zwinglian to Swiss Reformation. Is the path blazed by the editors of the Companion to the Swiss Reformation? This very brief overview of key themes of research would be incomplete without mentioning another recent development in research the role of women in the Zurich Reformation. Traditional Zwingli scholarship has been unanimous in the assumption that women did not play a significant role in Zwingli's life. Gottfried Locher, for example, does not discuss at all Zwingli's attitude to women. The first, to my knowledge, the first article on the topic in Zwingliana goes back to 1992, but was written by a Canadian, Edward Porchard, the late church historian of McGill University. Meanwhile, though, the ripples created by the women's movement have inevitably and appropriately permeated also our discipline. In recent years, a handful of both male and female scholars delved into the effects of the Reformation on the roles of women and men, as well as on the understanding of marriage and family, using Reformation women as an example 
including Anna Reiner Zwingli, Katharina von Zimmel, Anna Spieler Bollinger, and Margaret Lauer, and many, many others. For the remainder of this paper, it's a short I propose to address very briefly a few desiderata for further research. The first concerns something which is already in effect. If you peruse carefully the, the bibliography, you will notice it. The extension of the chronological limits The ex this is the last one. Uh, the extension of the chronological limits of the Reformation they partly reflect what has been called the cultural term in historiography. That is, historians pay more attention not just to the critical comments. The historians pay more attention not just to the critical moments of crisis and radical transformation of religion, but to much longer processes of implementation, adaptation, and the embedding of the new way of life into the fabric and customs of a community. Historically, <coughs> historians inquire uh, in church ordinances, in confession of faith, but they want to know what happened, what use was made of those confessions. In the case of Zurich and Swiss Reformation history, that has affected the time frame as well as the questions asked. Historians have come to see increasingly the importance of the late medieval context for shaping the response of the early evangelical movement. On the other hand, much recent research, regardless whether theological or political history, has concentrated on the so-called long reformation, the religious, institutional, and ecclesiastical political changes that extended from the 16th and the 17th centuries. But this is still in its early stages and needs, in my view, to be energetically advanced despite all the good accomplishments to date. The second desideratum concerns the geographical range of the Swiss Reformation. The older practice of identifying it with Zurich and Geneva, and the Anabaptists, which one finds in all the textbooks, has become obsolete. This is clearly a thought with one of the most peculiar feature of, features of the old confederations, for it, considered, it consisted of 13 sovereign cantons, each of which retained the freedom to regulate its own affairs and did not want to waive its sovereign rights. Besides the political, economic, and military rights, uh, these also included the right to determine the proper form of religious life. The conception of how the church should be reformed was left up to the individual cantons, which could decide freely what confession of faith, what form of liturgy, what catechism or church discipline they wanted to adopt. There were multiple forms of theological discourse and church organization, each with its distinctiveness according to place and time, all like with a significant degree of common identity and shared values and mutual responsibility. This means that there is a need for further archive-based research with respect to the reformed sister cities of Bern, Bath, and Schaffhausen, St. Gallen, 
with respect to the free state of the three leagues. And this inquiry must give appropriate recognition not only to the most influential theologian, but also to lesser known, yet no less significant. For example, Wolfgang Musculus, Nicolapadios, Dadiel, Commander Galici, and so on. Third, the thematic range. The Reformation is now as much a matter of the household as the church or the study. A, a new literature explores the social experience of reformed clergy and their sponsors. <coughs> Authoritative studies explore the impact of the Reformation on ritual and on the world of the emotions. The study of liturgies and catechisms is no longer considered marginal or antiquarian topic. And the preaching of sermons is no longer an arcane field of research. Similarly, the hymnody, psalmody, and music of the Reformation churches have received new levels of scholarly attention. By and large, research in these areas need to be improved urgently. But there is more. We need to reopen two old questions. A fuller understanding of the theological tent of the Swiss Reformation must look at the involvement of all its protagonists, including the Anabaptist, in the Sodalitas Erasmiana, within and beyond the boundaries of the Confederation. It is Certainly welcome news that such a task has been undertaken in a new publication by A. Nelson Barnett, and no doubt significant gains will be achieved in this area by the project of the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, led by our colleagues Christoph Strom, theological epistolary of the Southwest, in the southwest of the Empire in the early modern period. Finally, no major quantitative breakthrough will be achieved without interaction between the Swiss and the Geneva Reformation. This implies abandoning the idea that the Swiss Upper Rhine Reformation reached the research and the Calvin research properly belong in separate spheres, as has often been the case in the past. But not for Gottfried Locher, who mastered so admirably this dual role. A glance at contemporary research shows how fruitful this cooperation can be. If you happen to come across to Max Angamar, Bollinger, uh, Max Angamar, Prêché au XVIe siècle, la réforme du sermon réformée en Suisse you will understand what I mean by that. Conclusion. I have only briefly sketched out a handful of many fruitful themes of debate in our absorbing field of research. While looking forward with anticipation to the insights and debates over the coming few days, I conclude with one gentle reminder. To give coherence to these notes, there was a need, and certainly a wish, to bend my idiosyncrasies. For most of the persons and topics mentioned in this paper have been, or continue to be, a, a part substantial part of my lifelong quest for a better understanding of the Reformation. I don't know whether I succeeded in being completely balanced and fair. Of one thing, however, I am certain. Even if a rose would smell as sweet by any other name, 
in the Shakespearean world. The same cannot be said for the 16th century religious upheavals in the, upheavals in the, in the Confederation. In this highly competitive historiography of the European Reformation, there are more than enough reasons to keep me thinking that the best name is the Swiss. <laughs>